Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 299, recorded on Wednesday, July 5th, 2023. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. Last week, Sony engineer Tim Bird delivered an insightful presentation at the Linux Foundation's Embedded Open Source Summit, discussing recent improvements in the embedded Linux ecosystem, real-time kernel support, toolchain updates, and the growing adoption of the Rust programming language. Yes, my friends, the bird is the word, and during the presentation, Bird delved into various fascinating applications of Linux in the general world of embedded systems. Of course, there's a bunch in there, but one area that we've been watching and has been growing is Linux's use in satellites in space. And SpaceX's Starlink satellite constellation, for example, each one of their satellites has 60 processors, and each one of those processors runs Linux. And then on top of that, you've got SpaceX's ground stations and user terminals. Those also run Linux. The rockets run Linux. As of June 2023, there are over 4,600 Starlink satellites in orbit. And as impressive as that truly is, let's not forget about NASA's Mars Ingenuity helicopter, which also harnesses the power of Linux, now clocking in at 51 flights, and just recently made radio contact again. It's pretty remarkable to witness the widespread adoption of Linux in such cutting-edge activities. And just like that Linux copter, Linux's real-time support continues to be an active area of discussion for embedded development. Yeah, unfortunately, there's, there's no video of Bird's talk, but you can find the slide deck on a page that we have linked in the notes. And one of the areas I found educational was this timeline of recent commits. Starting in the 519 area, you really see a rapid pace of development that enables more and more embedded work cases. The talk focuses on a few key areas, the Linux kernel, of course, general technology, industry news, community information, and some of Bird's conclusions, which include, overall, embedded Linux is doing quite well. Still, he notes that new hardware is always being made, keeping everyone busy. LexD, the open source container management extension for Linux containers, has traditionally been closely tied to Canonical, obviously the creator of Ubuntu. While it has been part of the Linux containers project so far, Canonical recently decided to bring LexD under its direct control moving forward. In a recent update, the Linux containers project revealed that the LexD project is no longer affiliated with them. Canonical has moved the LexD source repository to Canonical's GitHub account, taking explicit ownership of the project. Also, the LexD website has transitioned to Ubuntu.com, and Canonical has assumed control over the LexD YouTube channel. Additionally, the community forums will migrate to something that Canonical hosts, and Canonical now manages the LexD CI infrastructure directly. The Linux Containers Project wrote in the announcement today, quote, Canonical, the creator and main contributor of the LexD project, has decided, after over eight years as part of the Linux Containers community, that the project would now be better served directly under Canonical's own set of projects. While the team behind Linux Containers regrets that decision and will be missing LexD as one of its projects, it does respect Canonical's decision and is now in the process of moving the project over. The Linux Containers project also followed up with what won't be changing, which includes the rest of the Linux Containers projects, which all remain unaffected, and the image server, which is currently used by both LexC and LexD, That'll keep operating mostly as normal, just with fewer architectures available going forward. More details for the curious are linked in the show notes. The June 2023 Steam Hardware and Software Survey has been released, revealing the significant impact of the Steam Deck on Linux market share. Yeah, looking at the numbers, Steam OS has seen a big jump in the last month or so. So, according to Valve stats they've just released, SteamOS now has 39.33% of the Linux market share. That's a 14% increase. Wow. Arch Linux comes in at number two at an 8.33%. Ubuntu 2204 comes in at number three with 7.87% of the market. And then in fourth place, it is the Steam Flatpak runtime with 6.02% of the Linux market. Then there's a long tail from there. Liam over at Gaming on Linux has been consistently reporting about the Steam Deck sales being positive, and now it seems like we're really seeing it 
in the numbers. Which makes me wonder, are we going to see another bump soon? What with the reports of the Steam Deck selling pretty well during that summer sale? I suspect we might. And I think also helping those numbers is there's just a growing list of what they call verified and playable titles for the Steam Deck. And that list crossed the 10,000 games mark as we record today. Now, (laughs) overall, Windows remains the gaming champ with 96.77% of the Steam user base. Mac OS comes in at number two at 1.79%. And Linux comes in at a mighty and growing 1.44%. OpenZFS recently merged a feature known as block cloning, and that code is now shipping with the release candidate for ZFS 2.2.0. Block cloning, which is similar to copy on write, allows you to copy a file, but without the need to actually read and then rewrite all of that file's data. It thus shares some similarities with the reflink option found in the GNU copy command that ButterFS users may be already familiar with. Pretty nice. However, block cloning is not currently integrated with any interface on Linux. It's been part of Solaris's version of ZFS for a while. Hmm. Mac OS and ButterFS have had block cloning for several years. In fact, Mac OS is even utilizing it as the default behavior when copying files using Finder. In many ways, block cloning is also similar to the existing deduplication feature of ZFS, but there are a few important differences. Deduplication is automatic, while block cloning requires specific system calls to make the clone. Deduplication also retains all data blocks in its table, whereas block cloning creates entries only for blocks that actually have multiple references. And deduplication requires data for hash calculations, while block cloning operates solely on metadata. There are also some performance differences between the two, such as block cloning using less memory, that's nice, and then a bunch of other little implementation details. If you're interested to find out more, check the link in the show notes because there are some other great things coming in 2.2.0, like improved Linux container support, prefetch improvements, and more. Linode.com slash LAN. We have some exciting news. Linode is now part of Akamai. All those developer-friendly tools like the Cloud Manager, the API, and the command line client that help you build, deploy, and scale in the cloud, they're still available. But now they're combined with Akamai's power and global reach, and they're expanding their services to offer more cloud computing resources and tools while still giving you that reliable, affordable, and scalable solution for yourself, an individual project, or a business of any size. And I can speak to that. As part of Akamai's global network of offerings, data centers are expanding worldwide, too. They're going to give you even more resources to help you grow your business or your project and serve your customers and your friends and your family. So why wait? Go experience the power of Linode, now Akamai. Go to linode.com slash LAN today to learn how Linode, now Akamai, can help you scale your applications from the cloud to the edge. And a special thank you to Linode for their longtime support of Linux Action News. We've really appreciated that. And for one last time, you can head over to linode.com slash LAN to support the show. And thank you to Collide. Collide.com slash LAN. Collide can help Okta users achieve 100% fleet compliance. If a device isn't compliant, well, the user can't log into your cloud applications until they fix that problem. And the moment Collide's agent does detect a problem, it alerts the user and also gives them instructions on how to fix it. If the user doesn't fix that problem within a set time, they're blocked. It's that simple. Collide's solution here ensures device compliance as part of authentication, which not only reduces support tickets and IT frustration, but it also helps ensure 100% compliance. Learn more or book a demo at collide.com slash LAN. We end this week with some news about the show. The podcast advertising market is going through a decline and some big transitions all at the same time. And Linux Action News seems to be caught in the middle. As we've watched these market changes develop, we've been actively considering what might be the best future direction for Linux Action News. We value, and we think you do too, the show's focus. The stories that mattered this week, and the details you should know about it. A.K.A. No Fluff. And put simply, 
right now we don't see a viable path forward that respects the goal of the show, at least not at the present moment. And we want to also find the right sponsor or maybe a set of sponsors we can work with who also share our same goals. So we're announcing, let's call it a summer break. Linux Action News will go on hiatus for a short period while we sort out a path forward for making the production viable and sustainable. It's definitely a tricky thing, and it's not a decision we've made lightly. Ideally, we could sustain the show on member support and boosts alone. But unfortunately, the land format doesn't really allow us to encourage and thank that kind of support the way that we'd like to. Because to be clear, that support does help. Yeah, and it was still close. Um, but because we don't really integrate that into the show's format, it hasn't really been a big successful area for LAN and hasn't generated a ton of support traditionally. To be clear, really, if ad sales were, say, strong on the other shows and expenses for the network weren't at an all-time high, then I think the Jupiter.Party member support would have likely been sufficient for us to produce LAN at maybe just a slight loss. But we're not in that position. We're actually more in a life and death survival position for a small business. And we have to be cautious proactively in managing our ongoing production costs. One of the golden rules in media production businesses is, is when, the, when the sun is shining, you make hay, right? So when the ad market's popping off, you work your butt off. And the flip side of that is when the advertising winter sets in, you hunker down and you focus on what you can sustain. And we've had a booming ad market for years that we're grateful for. But things are changing now, and we will make this adaptation so the network will remain safe and sound in the long term. But this isn't goodbye. We intend to return with a sustainable model for episode 300 after what's hopefully just a short summer break. And in the meantime, when news does break, we're going to incorporate it into Linux Unplugged. And you never know, if the circumstances call for it, we might just have to put up a quick LAN. Yeah, it's not like we're taking a break from the news. We're going to be following everything that's happening in Linux and the world of open source, just like we always have. So head over to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe, so that way you can grab our feed so when production does resume, you don't miss an episode. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. We'll still be checking the inbox. Yeah, and stay subscribed to Linux Unplugged, because you're going to find most of our news coverage right there during our break. We'll be back in the future with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. <laughs>